Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I feel a little bit like a, a man who brought cluster algebras to a gunfight, by, by which I mean the statistical mechanics conference, but hopefully it's okay. So this, this will be based on joint work with Pavel Galashin. Is there like a, oh, okay, good. So, uh, and uh, I will try to tell you how one can ask uh, for certain integrability properties, one of which will be zero algebraic entropy in, in some kind of combinatorial systems. There will be two main examples of systems. And uh, hopefully, I'll at least a little bit convince you that it's interesting to do it. Uh, okay, so the first example is called T systems. Uh, I will define cluster mutations for you. Many people have seen it. If you have, bear with me. If you have, so I usually tell, tell people uh, at this point that if you have never seen it before and you see it first time, you, you would ask yourself why on earth would you study that? Because, like, that's what I asked myself when I first time saw that. Uh, but uh, it, it seems weird definition, but, but it's somehow you, you need to trust that this actually arises in nature, in fact, in many, many situations in nature. So we have a graph a directed graph, and the only thing we forbid is two cycles. So we, we, we forbid uh, to, to have uh, edge from C to D, but also from D to C, that's forbidden. And we call this graph quiver just because we want to, and uh, uh, we're going to define mutation of, the, of this graph as follows. So if you, you, you pick one vertex, in this case, in this example, it will be vertex A, I guess here I called it V. So, and we're going to change the graph as follows. We, for each pair of arrows which passes through our vertex, right? So there's one incoming U to V and the other one leaving V to W. Create a direct edge. Then second step, reverse direction of all edges adjacent to V. And this last step, if this condition I told you that there are no two cycles violated, keep removing them until it's not violated anymore. Okay, so here we mutate at A. There is pass through A, C, A, B, and there is also pass C, A, D. We create direct edges CB to and CD. We reverse all edges adjacent to A, we get this. And now the only thing which kind of troubles us is this two cycle over here and we just remove it. Okay, this is the definition of cluster mutation. Again, if, if you see it first time, it's very unclear why would anybody do this, but somehow it turns out to be a natural thing to do. Okay, and to this one can also associate, any questions? Also, Please stop me if, if this, if I like to be stopped, I can repeat something again. Right, so you can click, so you, you can, <laughs> that's right. So you can click, you can choose vertex of your choosing and you can click there. And there are actual apps where you can do it, literally what I just said. You pick a vertex and you click. So if you click the same vertex again, you'll come back where you started. But if you click a different vertex, then it, you, you change it again, and then you can, so you, you can choose any sequence of clicks and see where it takes you. That's, that's uh, you're allowed to repeat it kind of, any, any sequence of, of such procedure. So this is what's called mutating a quiver. And to this you can associate algebraic dynamics. You, you plant a variable or a number or, or at, at each vertex element of some field and then as you mutate, you change the thing sitting in the vertex you're mutating, right? So if you, you don't change everything in other vertices, but in this particular one which you, where you click, you put a new variable xv prime there instead of old xv, and they're related by this kind of exchange relation, right? Where this is product of all variables on the other ends of outgoing arrows, and this is, well, I guess this is incoming arrows, and this is outgoing arrows, right? So in this case, there are two arrows going to B and D, so you, you would have X, B, X, D, and then there's one coming from C, you have X, C, and this is an exchange relation, right? So the new value X, A prime is equal to this guy divided by X, A. Right? You replace the old thing by the new thing. And now, what is a T system? T system is a choice of an original quiver and the sequence of clicks, the sequence of mutations, which gives you back something which looks like original quiver, isomorphic graph, right? So, and why is it interesting to do it? Because then you can repeat it again and again, right? So because you've got the same graph, you, 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 you can apply 
the same sequence again, it will be kind of the same field automorphism of, of this field of rational fractions of original variables. So, so once you have such sequence of clicks which brings you back to something which looks like what you started with, you can start repeating it and then you can study what happens to variables as, as you keep repeating it, right? So uh, the simplest situation of a T system is when you just do one click and you get back something which looks like the original thing, right? So two is a new one, right? So does everybody see that two is a new one? So, right, so you just rotate it, but otherwise it's isomorphic. So the next time you would, if you want to keep going in this T system, you would click on two and then three will be the new one, et cetera, and you just keep clicking around and around, right? And, and, and then, well, that's just, again, illustration of how mutation happened, but uh, hopefully, I mean, I, I will show you again, I mean, uh, but, uh, and, and, and that's what happens to variable, right? So first time we click, this guy x1 changes into this guy. And hopefully everybody can understand why it's this numerator here, right? So there's outgoing to three and four, come incoming from two and five, and that's why you get this thing. So, and then of course the next time you would click on x2 and x2 would change into something else, but in this something, it would be basically the same formula, but now we would use this guy uh, in the formula himself. So the formulas will be getting more and more complicated, at least in general. Okay, so in this talk, I will concentrate on one specific class of T-systems. So it's a very general notion, right? So all I ask is that you do a bunch of clicks, you come back to something which looks like you were started with. That's, turns out there's many examples for that. So we need to somehow to, to get, I don't know, tame results. We need to restrict ourselves to a class of such things. So our class of T-systems will be so-called bipartite recurrent, well, bipartite T-systems, which, which run on bipartite recurrent quivers. So what, what do I mean by that? I want my quiver to be bipartite in the sense, just sense of graph theory. I want to be able to color vertices black and white so that all edges connect white to black. Right? There's no white, white, or black, black. And I want, I want it so that if I click on all vertices of one color, I get back the, the, the thing I started with, possibly up to global reversal of all arrows. Right? And if you think about it, so first of all, since guys of one color are not connected to each other, it's easy to convince yourself that it doesn't matter in which order you click them. So I can really talk about just clicking all white vertices. And then, uh, so let, let's do a little exercise. So what happens here when I click on all white vertices? As I click on those guys, well, first of all, the arrows which are there will re keep reversing their directions, and I'll be creating a bunch of edges from U to V, right? Because I have paths like U, W1, W1V, I'll be creating a direct path UV for each of those guys. But then for those guys, I'll be uncreating them, right? Because I'll be creating edges from V to U, and they will be canceling out because they form two cycles. And this way, after I click all the white vertices, I'll get the same thing completely as I started with up to global reversal of directions of all arrows. Okay, do, do you want me to repeat this? This is like, it's clear? That's right. So if you do blacks, it also works, right? So if you do blacks, you create a bunch of arrows from W primes to Ws, but you also create a bunch of arrows from Ws to W primes, and they cancel each other out. So when you do it at twice, it's important that this k is equal to this k to cancel all arrows. Okay, so that's an example of bipartite recurrent quiver, meaning it's a quiver which is one bipartite, two, once you click on all of something of something one color, you get back something you started with. <coughs> okay, so that's another slightly tricky example, much more like the ones we'll be considering in this talk. That, so this is a, so you, you can convince yourself that this is actually a bipartite recurrent quiver, right? If you, let's say we click on white ones. <coughs> I click on A, I will create arrow from C to B, but I will destroy this arrow if I click on D, but I will create arrow from C, F to C, but I will destroy it when I click on E. So again, I will actually, well, the, all the arrows should be reversed here, but uh, it's, uh, let's just forget about that. So as I click on all white guys, I get those new values. And then if I click on all black guys, I will get those values, etc. So, and by the way, as you keep... Can, can, can I put so in this case, so yeah, you, you can. 
Sure. So I'm actually about to say something. So, well, th this, I, I mean, I just chose not to simplify it here, but so on the next step, you already will be able to see certain magic which happens in cluster algebras. So is there something called Laurent phenomenon, which means that you will keep getting rational functions that, well, after simplification, after you kill common factors in numerator and denominator, denominator will always stay monomial in original variables. Does it make sense? So you, like, it's not surprising so far, right? So here we were dividing by D, so it's not surprising it's no denominator is monomial. And here we, you know, we have A, E, G, C in denominator, which is monomial. So that's not surprising. But on the next step, when we mutate the white guys again, here we'll be dividing by C plus BF, right? So we, we will take this guy times this guy plus this guy, and we'll divide this by, C, by, by this guy. So uh, in principle, we could see C plus BF in denominator. But we won't. That, that's part of the magic of cluster algebras. That, that it always cancels out. And this, this is called Laurent phenomenon. And in fact, this is the first form of integrability we see in this talk. This is very close to what uh, people who study discrete integral, uh, integrable systems call singularity confinement. So in, in, and in fact, I, well, I could try to argue that any singularity confinement may be reducible to an instance of this if you choose your tau functions correctly, whatever that means. So, but, uh, uh, okay, so is this example clear? So this is what we'll be looking at. So now the simplest form of integrability is Excuse me. periodicity. Yeah. Is there a uh, simple way to see that, that this is going to cancel out? No, no, that's, uh, it's not super hard, but it requires certain tricky argument. It's called caterpillar lemma. And it was one of the sort of magical things about cluster algebra that this cancellation really does always happen. Yeah, it's not an easy, it's not an obvious statement at all. Oh, okay, so now we have set up this machinery. So we want to study T systems which have some property. And our first property will be just periodicity. Okay, so if we start, well, this is just uh, a reminder what our AD uh, Denki diagram. Forget uh, affines for now, so this is a simply laced uh, finite type Denkin diagrams. And they will be so they will be our legos which will, with which we will be playing. So I'm going to tell you how to create T systems which will exhibit periodicity, certain bipartite recurrent uh, quivers in which if you just keep clicking black white black white black white, eventually you come back to where you started with, and sort of. Uh, for, for no easy reason at all again. So there is, uh, it, it was actually, you will, I, I'll show you the history, it was a conjecture for a while that this periodicity happens. And it looks like if you run it on computer, it looks like there's some kind of bizarre random numbers in the middle until, you know, click number 20 when you suddenly get back the original number. So that's, it, it, it's, it's not obvious at all that for those guys it will come back. So let me tell you, so first of all, we'll be taking tensor products of <coughs> Dinkin diagram. So, uh, okay, so if, if I, I didn't carefully define it, it's, uh, but hopefully, I, I don't know, ho hopefully it's clear what I mean by tensor product in the just graph theoretic. So each horizontal slice here is a dinking diagram of, of D5, type D5, and each vertical slice is a dinking diagram of type A3. Okay, does, does anybody want me to say something more about it? So even if you don't know what's D5 and A3, you, you should see that each horizontal slice in one is the same thing and each vertical slice. And that's the sense in which we took the product. We took this, it's a, I mean, in computer it's called Cartesian product of, of graphs also, et cetera. So hopefully it's on an intuitive level clear what we do. And we, of course for cluster algebras we need quivers. So we need to orient this whole thing and the, the, the correct way to orient it is, I mean, there's official way to say it, which is uh, long and painful, but unofficial is you just, want to have lots of oriented uh, four cycles. So you, you, you orient your edges so as to have oriented four cycle everywhere you can have possibly oriented four cycle. <laughs> okay, so, and this is uh, just, uh, so this will actually be very important uh, very soon. If you didn't know about how we created this thing, just it was D5 times S3, you could actually recover it in the following way. We have a bipartite graph. It has white vertices, black vertices, there are two types of edges. White to black, correct. White to black and black to white. So you can color one of them red, the other blue, and you will see that it kind of splits into 
uh, those chunks which are exactly the horizontal and vertical slices I was talking about. But very soon you will see examples where it will split more interestingly in those chunks. Like this was, of course, we created this example this way, but soon we will see more interesting examples. So it was proved in 2013 that for any such tensor product of finite thinking diagrams, if you run this bipartite T system on them, you mutate all black, all white, all black, all white, uh, it will be periodic. Okay, so it was proved in 2013, and in fact, you can say exactly what the period is. So Coxeter diagram, well, thinking diagrams have something called Coxeter number associated to them. Uh, this is the rule, that's what Coxeter numbers are. And, and then since you're taking tensor product of two linking diagrams, there are two Coxeter numbers you could deal with and you just add them up, well, times two and that's, that's your period. So it predicts exactly what the period is. And just let me show you an example. So this is A2 times A2. This is everybody happy? Right, A2 is just a path with two vertices, one edge. And this is one edge times one edge oriented so that there is a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, so it could accidentally happen that period is some number dividing this number. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but uh, ge generically this will be the period, that's right. I think it's either half that number or... That Usually it's either half, no, I don't, always it always, yeah. okay, maybe it's always either half of this number or this number. No, it's not always. Sometimes it's just fixed point, in which case it's one. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, what, what? Depending yeah, depending on the original variables, that's right. That's right. Uh, okay, so just to run an example so you can see the calculation just how with your own eyes. Uh, so let's start with just this nice example, put ones in variables, then mutate white guys, where do I get this two? It's uh, one plus one divided by one, which is two. Right, and, and then I, where do I get this four? It's two plus two divided by one, which is four. And then if you keep going, uh, well, on, on the next step, you will come here. And this, by the way, is the case when it's half period. This, this was actually this due to a great symmetry of initial conditions. We, it took us six steps rather than 12 steps. I think it, it should have taken us 12 steps in general here. Okay, so this is a two times a two example. So I told you it was proved by Keller, Keller in 2013. It was, okay, so here's the history. It was conjectured in a very different but equivalent formulation, or almost equivalent formulation. It was conjectured by Zemolochikov uh, in 1991, and he only conjectured it for just single dinking diagram, right? So you can just imagine taking one single dinking diagram, oriented edges so that every vertex is either source or sink, and then, you know, it's a bipartite graph, all finite type dinking diagrams are bipartite graphs. You just click black, white, black, white. Uh, it's periodic. He conjectured it was surprisingly hard. So uh, the next thing was, which happened was two years later, people realized that this generality I just told you about works, that you can take tensor products. And then uh, Frankel and Janice, I'm not sure how to Janice pronounce it. So they, they proved it for just a single Dinkin diagram of type A. Uh, and well, and uh, that's already sort of, I mean, that, that they tried and kind of failed to, to do it more generally. So it was a hard problem, right? So the next thing which happened was all the way in 2003, where Fermin and Zielinski used cluster algebras to prove it uh, for any single Dinkin diagram, any type. And uh, everybody is with me? I, this is history. So uh, this was actually one of sort of first validation of the theory of cluster algebras. So people, yes. Around, around the year 2000. Yeah, so the previous results were not using cluster algebra. That's right. So how did they state their conjecture? Well, you can just define recurrences. I mean, you don't have to call them mutations. You can just say that you just. So they must have had some reason to study these. Uh, That's right. So. T systems were defined, right? Right. T systems were known way before cluster algebras. And uh, I think the magical words for the Malochikum were, were thermodynamic beta and zats. And I honestly tried to read the Malochikov, and it's, 
almost never in my life I understood so little when I tried to <laughs> read paper as, uh, as this one. So, but yeah, so the, the, the question itself is not motivated by cluster algebra. So, but, but so, right, so what I was saying is that for cluster algebra, this was sort of one of the first validations in the sense that when Fermin and Zilvinsky discovered them, people were saying, well, okay, this is all very nice, but can you actually prove something which people couldn't prove before you using all this weird machinery? And this was one of the first things they did. They proved this uh, periodicity using their machinery. Okay, and then there was a very beautiful argument by Volkov for rectangles, right, for basically products of two paths. The, 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 that work, but it's, uh, the method it uses is extremely specific to this case. Uh, there's absolutely no idea, nobody has how to generalize it to other cases. And then finally, as I said, in 2013, Keller proved it in, in, in complete generality using some kind of categorification, cluster categories, etc. Okay, so this was this, uh, the, the, the history. Now let me start telling you a little bit about what, what we asked and what we did. So you can say that if you start with a tensor product of two finite type Dinkin diagrams, then resulting T system is periodic. You could, I mean, the simple question you could try to ask is, are there other, uh, other examples? And of course, as I said, just talking about generic T system is too general. It's just talking about any sequence of clicks which brings you back where you started. I mean, nobody even knows how to find all of this or describe all of this. But if you restrict yourself, say, say we will restrict ourselves to this world of bipartite recurrent quivers, right? The, the world I defined for you. Within this world, are there other examples or are there only examples of those tensor products of Dinkin diagram? And sort of very soon you realize that there are other examples. And then so we were able to prove the following theorem. So I, I, soon I will show you other examples, you will see. But uh, l let me start stating the theorem. So let's say we have a bipartite recurrent quiver. Then the following are equivalent. So one con equivalent condition is that this T system associated to it is periodic. Have everybody is with me? It, you lost, ask me something if you lost me. So I'm about to start saying the theorem. Okay, oh, are you sure? Oh, okay, so the next equivalent condition. It turns out that it's periodic if and only if uh, it has a fixed point. And in fact, out of all the things I will name, that's the only one which actually makes sense for any T system, not just bipartite recurrent. And I, I still believe in it as a conjecture that uh, the, the any T system is periodic if and only if it has a fixed point. And by fixed point, I mean positive real fixed point. So let me show you how it works. So here's an example of, from our current set of examples, A3 times A3. So I guessed that the fixed point will have uh, dihedral symmetry. In principle, I didn't have to, but this way the system is shorter. What does it mean to be a fixed point? It means that wherever I mutate, I get the same value back, right? So if I mutate here, I should get A. So A squared should be equal B to plus B. And B squared should be equal to A squared plus C, right? And at C, you get this. And then you solve the system. It turns out it has positive real solution. So, and, and then if you were to try try this trick with something which is not periodic, you would see it doesn't work. There's no positive real solution. Okay, so that's one equivalent condition. And you say, so when you say fixed point, is, is a, are, you, are you assuming that, is there a theorem that every fixed point is, has, is positive real? No, no, you have to specifically ask for positive real. So the theorem says it's periodic if and only if it has a positive real fixed point. So it says nothing about other fixed points. So the other one is that it has strictly subadditive labeling. So again, let me show you what I mean. It just means that uh, at each vertex, I want to put a number such that twice this number is bigger than the sum of blue neighbors, and twice that number is bigger than the sum of red neighbors. So if you've seen it, so there is uh, kind of well known to people in Lee theory, uh, so-called Winberg's uh, way to define Dinkin diagrams, it's kind of, this is just a sort of two colored version of that. So Winberg says the following, he says, uh, take a graph, just a directed graph, and you want to put positive numbers at its vertices so that twice number is bigger than sum of his neighbors for each vertex. And it's, it's sort of remarkable that such simple condition cuts out, I mean, it's not, I mean, people who know that it's not that remarkable, but it's kind of remarkable that it, such simple condition cuts out for you exactly EGE Dinkin diagram. So 
So for all other ways to get AD, EDE, ADE uh, are excruciating. Like if you've ever seen how <laughs> Lie algebra are classified semi-simple. So it, it, like it's the simplest way I know to, to define this ADE set of Dinkin diagrams. So here we do the same except we separately ask that twice each number should be bigger than sum of blue neighbors and sum of red neighbors, where blue and red is as I defined before. Right, and then you can find the solution in this case, and, and more generally, so the theorem says that you can find the solution if and only if uh, the T system is periodic. Okay, and, uh, and the last condition is that it has to be a finite box product finite quiver, which says the following. So remember I told you that if we didn't get this quiver, in this tensor product way. Let's just, somebody gives us some quiver which is, uh, has underlying bipartite graph. There are two colors of edges. You know, there are, well, there are black to white edges and there are white to black edges. And respectively, uh, we can color them, I know, red, red and blue. And then we can uh, look at uh, red components and blue components. And what we can ask is that red components and blue components should be finite type Dinkin diagrams. And if it's so, then we call it finite box finite quiver. Okay, so of course, th this was a silly example because that's how I built this. I, I took a product of uh, two things. So of course, red and blue components will be two, uh, will be, all will be finite type thinking diagrams, but it turns out there are other examples. So here's another example. This is not a tensor product of two thinking <coughs> diagrams. Okay? So, and in fact, you can see it because uh, there are red components and they're all finite type thinking diagrams, but they're not all the same. Like, right, there is this, this is type D guy and this is also type A guys. And similarly for, for blue components, uh, this is type D and all of those are type A. Uh, so this is an example of finite box finite quiver, which is not a tensor product. And uh, the theorem says that uh, this T system associated to this is pure. It's easy to check that it is a recurrent bipartite quiver, meaning that if you mutate all white or all black, you get the same thing again. But uh, uh, right, so I guess you, you, if you run it on a computer, you'll see that eventually you, you come back to where you started. Okay, no, no questions so far? It's a funny name, why finite box finite? Yeah, it, it just, uh, it was signed kind of like times, but... Yeah, sort of. <laughs> it, was, it was not a very <laughs> good name, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I mean, there was a paper before us which used something like that. That's why we used it. So, I will tell you right now about the periods. That's right. That's a good question. So in fact, you can tell, I can tell you that the periods are the same. It's a sum of two Coxeter numbers. OK, so now at this point, you should tell me that I'm lying to you, right? <laughs> because before, you know, before we had all red guys look the same and all blue guys look the same. So they, there was a red Coxeter number and a blue Coxeter number. But it turns out that two, say, blue guys can be different, but inside the same thing like that, only if their Coxeter numbers are the same. So there's still red Coxeter number and blue Coxeter number, even though they, they're not all the same actual graphs anymore. So here's how it looks like. So in this case, we have what? We have D6, and we have A9 and A9. So for A9, Coxeter number is 9 plus 1, which is 10. And for D6, it's 6 times 2 minus 2, which is also 10. And right, and similarly, there is the same Coxeter number, the blue Coxeter number. So the period is still the same, which in this case will be 32. Um, okay, so but okay, I, this is still unsatisfactory in the following cells. I told you that one thing which nobody knows when it happens happens when three other things which nobody knows when they happen happen. So that, that's not a very, <laughs> very satisfactory answer, but. It turns out that those guys, finite box finite guys, they can, they can be completely classified. Basically, there is five infinite families and 11 exceptional cases. One of the infinite families is the one I told you, the tensor product of Dinkin diagrams. There is four more infinite families and 11 exceptional cases. This is the biggest exceptional case. You can see a bunch of E8s in, in this picture. So this is, so in fact, this classification is not due to us. It turned out that uh, in, completely different context. It was already existed in the literature. So John Stambridge was looking at W graphs for products of dihedral groups. And it turns out that finding them is equivalent to the following. It's finding pairs of finite type Cartan matrices which commute. And if you stare at our question long enough, you will see that 
we are also looking for pairs of Cartan matrices which commute, finite type Cartan. They don't have to be connected, right? So there's, there's a blue Cartan matrix and a red Cartan matrix. They're both of finite types, they're not connected, right? Each of them has some blocks because there are connected components, red, red chunks and blue chunks. And, and the commuting means that just this quiver is recurrent. If you click, you get back the same one. So, and it turns out that this question, so this classification already existed in the literature and this is one of the examples from it. So let me move on to other kinds of integrability. So, right, so this was uh, the end of uh, periodicity uh, portion. Any questions before I move on? So, yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. This is period 120, right? If I click 60 times, I'm sort of maxing the wild coefficients. Do we have some sort of understanding of what those uh, coefficients mean? Like intermediate values? Yeah. No, and in fact, I think they would be way too large for your computer to do it uh, as variables. Yeah, I, I think that's right. So, no, we, we, we don't. I, I don't think we do. Even numbers, too large. Even numbers would be too large. But, I mean, so. No, two to the six is not a big one. Well, it grows. No, uh, it's definitely too large. It's the it, numbers. It's more like two to two. <laughs> I, I know, it, it's large, it's, it's pretty large. So, uh, so in type A, in type A, this uh, A time A grid and doing this black, it's basically like tahedral recurrence. So in this case, at least if you didn't have a boundary, there are explicit formulas. And we actually use it to prove some things about this specific. But in other types, and especially for those exceptional ones, we have no idea what the formula would be for intermediate uh, time. Okay, so now the simplest way of, like, I guess the, the first part was about periodicity, which is the simplest form of integrability. Okay, so now you, you could guess that there are, you, so here, here's the philosophy. So you, you could guess there are some other forms of properties of T systems you could ask for which would still give us interesting number, and you could guess it because you may know that there is something called a fine root system. <laughs> okay, so all of what I talked about so far was somehow about things which, which have chunks which look like finite type Dinkin diagrams. So there is something called a fine type Dinkin diagrams, which is, uh, <laughs> which is like a finite type Dinkin diagram, but slightly more interesting and, and not fine. <laughs> so uh, what, what you could ask, just like I defined finite box finite quivers, you could ask what are the finite uh, box affine quivers or affine box affine quivers, right? And then this is sort of roundabout way, but, but then you could ask what property should you ask of your T system in order to get exactly that classification? And so here's the answer. So we know the finite times finite case corresponds to periodic T systems. Uh, affine times affine case Let's do a simple example. So this is just uh, A11, a fine root system of type A, times A1, which is finite. So if, if you run it, it looks like this. So the formula is just you take the other guy squared plus one over the old guy, and you keep alternating. So if you start running it, you, you know, one square plus one over one is two, two square plus one over one is five, et cetera. And you may recognize those numbers. Do people recognize those numbers? Those are like every second Fibonacci number or, or, or something. So and the important thing is that they satisfy this linear recurrence. So in fact, this will be the property we, we will ask. So we, if we have a T system, let's ask for the following property. Pick any of its vertices. You have some sequence of variables. As time goes, you get some sequence of variables there. They form, form, form a, a sequence. Ask that we want each such sequence to be linearizable, right? To satisfy linear recurrence with uh, fixed coefficients. Uh, and this will, so somehow I will tell those conjecture slash theorems soon, but this, this will correspond to finite times a fine case. Is, uh, is periodic also linearizable? Yeah, so periodic is linearizable because you satisfy recurrence A i plus n equals A i, which is a linear recurrence. <laughs> okay. No, that's a good question. That's, 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 that's correct. So now, Okay, so what, what would be the property you would ask to get a fine times a fine classification? So it turns out it's this, well, let's first do an example. So if you try to run the example with just this kind of symmetric initial conditions, 
you see that it grows really fast, and particularly there is no hope to be linearizable, which is expected because it's not in finite times of financing. So, but what what's true is that it grows as exponent of a polynomial. And so, in, in a second, I'll define what, what it means to have zero algebraic entropy. And it turns out that somehow the correct property to ask here is zero algebraic entropy. And then there's everything else, which is neither of those. And if you try to run everything else, uh, it grows too fast, too fast to be nice. At least, I, well, I, I don't know in what sense it would be nice. So, so this factorizes. Oh, say it again? How to factorize it? Didn't try. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to factorize this number. So, so we will call this wild case, right? So it grows as exponent of exponent. So this is sort of foreshadowing of a theorem. Another foreshadowing, I'm reminding you what uh, affine linking diagrams look like. So the only thing, we, we, we don't use uh, odd cycles in type A because they're not bipartite. But otherwise, it's just a fine linking diagram here. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I do not know the answer. So I think uh, the problem is that to iterate the cluster mutation, you need to divide, right? So, and if you wanted to do it mod prime number, you man may run into a situation where you're dividing by zero. But, but then of only have integers, right? But, but on the other hand, if you just pre-compute it with integers and afterwards take it the modul modular prime number, that could be interesting, and I don't know what the answer is. So it's a good question. So it's possible there is some interesting properties to look for in, in, that, in that language. OK, but, but let me get back. So one last thing before I start st stating the most general theorems and conjectures. So what does it mean to have zero algebraic entropy? So let's say we have some kind of algebraic dynamical system, but we, which I mean we just have some rational map, which we keep applying again and again and again. Okay, that's, that's what it will be, and uh, uh, we write the expressions for each, you know, keys iteration, and we take the, so we take the degree, uh, which you define whatever, like bigger of the degrees of numerator and denominator or whatever. So, and and you take log divided by t and take limit t goes to infinity. Okay, so, and uh, the, it turns out that somehow in, I, I believe that it's. There is a theorem to the extent that in some class of such systems, in order to be integrable in uh, Arnold Liouville sense, in, in which people like to consider integrability, you have to have zero algebraic entropy. So, so it's a question sort of uh, whether you consider this definition of some form of integrability or, 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 or a sort of uh, what, what's called the sign for integrability defined some other way. So, <coughs> so I personally think word integrability is just equivalent to magic, it's just there is some stigma to saying magic, so people say integrability, but, uh, so, but uh, I think of it as a, as a form of integrability. So having zero algebraic entropy is, a, is one form of integrability. So here's our conjecture, slash soon will be, I'll list which parts of this are theorem, so, which is implicit in what I just told you, right? So this part we already know, that it's finite box finite if and only if it's periodic, and in fact we, 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 we know complete list of finite box finite, finite quivers. It's a fine box of fine if and only if it's linearizable. It's a fine box of fine only if and only if its algebraic entropy is zero. And it's wild otherwise if, if algebraic entropy is bigger than zero. OK, so I told you the first part is, uh, is what I told you already. In this linearizable finite times a fine world, we can actually prove what, would you think, what you would think is a harder direction. So we, we can prove that if it's linearizable, it must be a fine box finite, finite quiver. In fact, we have complete classification of those. So we, we have a zoo of uh, things where we say, if you're a linearizable bipartite system, you must be in this zoo. So what we don't know is that everybody in this zoo works. So, and it turns out, so basically, yeah, I mean, we, we know it in type A times type A, thanks to those, those explicit formulas which exist in this case, but in, in other cases, uh, uh, well, I guess there are other, so we, we only know it in uh, I type A times type A case, basically. That's uh, the statement. And, and that similar thing happens in a fine times a fine situation. If you have algebraic entropy, ask for algebraic entropy is zero, we can prove that it has to be in certain zoo of all things which are fine times a fine, which we can classify. 
uh, but we don't know that uh, everything in the zoo actually has a zero algebraic interval. Yeah, I think here it's more important that we don't have explicit formulas for them. Okay, so to show you some of this, so this is a member of the zoo for a fine times a fine. This is a, a toric like a toric uh, quiver, right? So all the red components and all the blue components here are type A Dinkin diagrams. It's just a kind of a torus, but there's uh, like also you have a freedom of do this twist, kind of uh, to glue it, glue it not exactly right, kind of. Uh, uh, okay, so that's one example, or here are some other examples. So overall, this uh, this family over here will have 41 infinite uh, family and 13 exceptional cases. It was very painful to list them in the paper and <laughs> to prove that this is all of them. But uh, so this is a uh, you you can check that all components here are of uh, affine type Dinkin diagrams. Uh, this is results. Okay, so this was the end of this this section, but. I, I, this is sort of a positive note. I mean, besides the pretty pictures, we were able to do the following. We, we were able to define certain class of dynamical systems, ask for certain property to hold, and to completely classify things which have this property. <coughs> okay, so and so, so I, I guess part of the point of this talk is that it's an interesting game to play, and also especially if it works out and you get actual classification. So let me show you another, uh, another class of systems. We tried to play the same game. We couldn't pr prove as strong results as classification, but we still found some interesting things by trying to ask the same question. So, let's not, so now I will switch to a different type of recurrences, which I will call R systems as opposed to T systems. And any questions before? I start on those, so th this will be much shorter. Sec, we have less results on this, but uh, any questions? But it actually is more related to some of the things which have been talked about, uh, like geometric crystals, etc. Well, or not talk, but I yeah. Are they what? Are they definite? Because this kind of asymptotic behavior is typical for definite functions, right? Uh, so the sequence. I don't remember what definite means. The answer is no. Okay, Igor knows the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, linear differential equation. Okay, I, I see. Or difference. So, so Igor studies actually somewhat related questions, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure if he says no, then the answer is no. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me start talking about our system. So R stands for some for for the word draw motion. So we, uh, Jessica in our audience was one of the people who came up with this term. Uh, we we call those things R systems because they're slightly more general than draw motion, or somehow they draw motion in a more general sort of setting. So let let me tell you. So it again will be run some on some kind of directed graphs. And it's an interesting sort of thing to, to, I mean, it's related to, to for example, things Ivan Corwin talked in, in his talk, et cetera. Even, even if I won't show you how it's related, it's related. So let's consider a strongly connected directed graph, right? So you can get from any vertex to any other by following the edges uh, along the arrows. And we're going to define the following uh, system of equations. Okay, so and this is not a recurrence, strictly speaking. This is a system of equations. So what am I saying here? So uh, dash means uh, future, right? So we, we are in the present, and there's the next step, which is the future. So the equation, at each vertex, we write the following equation. The old value of the variable times the new value of the variable is equal to product of two things. First thing is you sum over all outgoing edges the variable standing at endpoints of those outgoing edges. The second term, you sum over all incoming edges, one over variables which stands at, at the other end of the incoming edge, but in the future. So that's why it's not a recurrence. You define a future variable in terms of a future variable. So, but, so what, well, with an inverse here. Okay, so you write this equation down for each, each vertex, and then you have a system of equations. Uh, so 
And it turns out that the system has a unique solution up to global rescaling, right? So it's easy to see that if something is a solution, then if you multiply, if you multiply all XV primes by some number, it will still be a solution. So we are, we are talking about projective points, right? So pro points in projective space. But up to this global rescaling, it turns out that there is a unique solution. So here we can check that, for example, this works. And in a second, I will tell you where this comes from again, but just bear with me for a second that this is something that comes from somewhere. So, okay, let, let's check that this works. So B times C times C plus D is equal to C plus D, that's this term. And now incoming edge, there's only one, but we need to take its end over here in the future. So we have one over BC inverse, which is just BC. So we have C plus D times BC, which will be B times C times C plus D. Okay, I, I, so just trust me that it works. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't follow that. So it turns out that you can actually write down uh, the, the solution in terms of some kind of you know, rooted trees combinatorics. So I told you that there is a unique solution. So uh, let's do the following. Uh, uh, well, okay, I guess let's read this first. So, oh, I guess I didn't write. So we are going to consider something called arborescences rooted at uh, vertex V and denote them this way. And then the theorem is that uh, one way to write sort of to the solution is that xv prime is equal to one over sum of all uh, weights of all our arborescences rooted in this vertex. Where I need to tell you, so arborescence is just a directed tree towards this vertex, right? So it's a tree, uh, spanning tree, and it, uh, all edges must point in the direction of this root. Uh, and the, the only slight trickiness is how you take the weight. So in what way, since the weight of this guy is ACD and weight of this guy is AD squared, does anybody see? Can anybody guess in what sense am I taking the weight? You can guess? Yeah. Okay. Anybody but Rick can. can. I, I do this in my class a lot, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what you do, you take uh, heads of arrows. You multiply the heads of arrows, right? So here there's arrow pointing to D, arrow pointing to D, and arrow pointing to A, so that's why you get AD squared. So, so you sum over all, uh, all uh, uh, arborescences rooted at particular vertex and, and, and sum their weights, and th that's uh, one over that is uh, the new variables. It's a determinant of velocity. It is a determinant of velocity, that's right. So another way, so an interesting way to write it, by the way, is in terms of inflow is equal to outflow, just if you like, if the previous ways are too elaborate, for each edge you can, pointing from V to U, you can, let's call its weight the present of its head divided by the future of its tail. And then it turns out that the system I showed you is equivalent to that to inflow being equal to outflow. So that's kind of an elegant way to write the same system. Uh, uh, unique uh, polynomial solution. Yeah, I. Because suddenly there's a bunch of solutions to any set of algebraic equations, so you have to pick some solution. No, I don't think so. Oh, the system is typically linear. So yeah, the sy system is very close to being linear. That's right. No, I, th I think we literally mean unique solution, except up to this rescaling everything by the same number. So that's that's the claim. Okay. So that's uh, the thing. So again, I, this is an example with uh, I, how much <coughs> time do I have? I don't have much time, so I'll just skip this. So this is I just show you how this arborescence formula works. Let me just show you what's interesting about this. So uh, we're, what what it's related to? So. Uh, those uh, R systems, they, they originally something like that existed on partially ordered sets. And uh, the most important of them, which being the Gelfan settling patterns. So, you, and they consisted of multiple application of operation called toggling. So, and this operation of toggling is actually what is built into many, many things in this birational world. Uh, so, like geometric crystal world, etc. Those toggles on Gelfan settling patterns, so you can realize a lot of like geometric RSK can be realized like that, et cetera. So it's sort of the original, originally it comes from here, and then there is some bizarre connection to mirror symmetry, which I will not talk about. And uh, 
And, and, and then uh, there is a relation to the zymological periodicity I just showed you because it turns out that in some cases those R systems are periodic and in some very special cases this periodicity can be reduced to uh, zymological periodicity I showed you before, etc. So anyway, so this, this slide is meant to at least somewhat convince you that uh, maybe there, <laughs> there is motivation for defining this whole thing. So uh, I, I'll skip it, but then here's what we do. Let's, let's try to claim, so as I said, there are people have studied before which of those R systems are periodic? So in fact, there are some nice interesting theorems about it, et cetera. So, but let's try to play the same game with algebraic entropy. Right? So we'll just pick a direct, uh, strongly connected directed graph, run the thing on it, and then just to try to plot. By run, sorry, by run the thing you mean? Just uh, polynomials. You get right? the future in terms of the past. Yes, just. You, the future of the future is the next Yeah, you iterate this arborescence map. That's right. So you get future of the future of the future and you keep big, getting bigger and bigger formulas and then you just ask your computer to plot the degree versus time. And then this is how the answer looks like if it has zero algebraic entropy. That's how the degree looks. Uh, uh, square root of uh, degree, so you can see that actual degree grows, grows quadratically because square root lo looks linearly and then of course logarithm would go to zero if you divide by t. So it's a zero algebraic entropy in this case, the algebraic entropy would be zero, while the non-zero case looks something like that. If, if you, this is how the degree looks like, if you take some kind of root, it will still grow pretty much the same way, and then only after you take log, it grows linearly, so if you take limit of z divided by t, it will not be zero, it will be some other constant, the slope of this thing. So, and this way you can find interesting examples of R systems which were known before. You just run this thing and you ask, let's detect which strongly connected directed graphs have the zero algebraic entropy property and then you, you look for families of such graphs and see if they, you, you can analyze them. So I, and I think I'm out of time so I will stop but uh, th this is, there are some, so they related to SOMA sequence, DP3 skewer, uh, toric, some kind of graphs, etc. So you, we found basically the moral of the story is that we found quite a bit of families of graphs where interesting things happen, including the new examples of Laurent phenomena, the thing I told you. So there are examples of uh, this Laurent phenomenon which we found, which, uh, which are not explainable by any kind of cluster algebra. And we found them by asking this question of which of those guys have zero algebraic entropy. So this is, uh, thank you, sorry I went a couple of minutes over.